So welcome back to all. We are about to start the session. Yeah. Yes. So since uh, we are streaming uh, in YouTube also, so many of the participants has uh, joined uh, through YouTube also, sir. So we shall start the technical session. It's a high time for us to have a third, uh, very important and uh, interesting session on emerging non-thermal technologies in food processing, for which we have with us a renowned food technologist, Dr. Hosali S. Ramaswamy, Professor, Department of Food Science, McGill University, Canada. So now I request Dr. Tiparna sir to introduce our expert to our participants. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Srinivas, for uh, kind of, uh, I'm very pleased to introduce our today's uh, lead speaker, Dr. Vasali uh, Ramaswamy. He's a professor in the Department of Food Science uh, uh, in the Agriculture and Agriculture Chemistry, the McDonald campus, McLean University, USA. Uh, Ramaswamy, Ramaswamy is born in uh, Oxford, India, completed his bachelor's degree from Bangalore University in 1970, and he pursued his uh, Master of Food Technology from the PFTRI in 1972. Then he moved to Canada for his uh, uh, master degree uh, and PhD in the University of British and Columbia in 1979, uh, 1983 respectively. Uh, he joined uh, McGill University in, as an assistant professor in 1987. Dr. Ramaswamy primary research interest in thermal processing uh, and related process, process including, uh, including a thin profile as a retard poach, uh, septic processing of low acid liquid and particulate food, food sterilization in rotational autoclaves and microwave processing. His current research also includes other areas such as pasteurization, freezing, drying, postage technology, food system rheology, and computer modeling. Dr. Ramaswamy early research on thermal processing resulted in several key development that is demonstrating heat transfer distribution. Uh, they not temperature. DA performance indicator for the over pressure cooker. It's long term activities at Institute for Thermal Processing Specialist and development of guidelines for heat penetration testing uh, accumulated is getting uh, getting him a prestigious IFTPS. Uh, Marvin Tong uh, Award during 2014. Dr. Ramaswamy has contributed significantly for, uh, to exploration of no novel techniques like uh, microwave, radio frequency, home heating, and the use of extrusion processing technology for creating value-added products. Dr. Ramaswamy more recent research stress in the areas of non-thermal processing of food, especially application of high-pressure processing, uh, supported by funding from the Canada Foundation for Innovation. He has established a state of the art first of its kind in high pressure uh, pressure, uh, pressure technology pilot plant facility in McDonald campus leading Canada in the its area. For his con outstanding contribution in food processing and engineering research, Dr. Ramaswamy was awarded uh, uh, as a time achievement awards uh, uh, during uh, 2015 at I ICEF 12 at Quebec City. Uh, Quebec City. A current area of research is post harvest management to improve the livelihood, uh, livelihood through uh, administration by the cooperation agreement with the NASA. Then, innovative novel and alternative food processing concept for enhanced quality retention and improved process efficiency. The evolution of novel techniques in food processing that assures safety, improves the energy savings and cost efficiency, and enhance the quality of retention. Sir has published many books, out of which Postage Technology of Fruits and Vegetables, Food Processing, Principle and Application, Home Heating, and many more. 
now i am very happy to uh, request uh, 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 invite uh, our today's speaker dr amo swami sir to to uh, take over this session thank you sir over to you okay uh, yeah thank you so much uh, for the uh, a long introduction okay it's uh, uh, it's something i think i had prepared long time ago uh, not very recent one but still it uh, does capture you know my uh, my um, uh, research uh, uh, career so it's nice thank you uh, i appreciate that and um, uh, a good good uh, actually it's good morning here it's 6 o'clock in the morning uh you know but in india it's a good evening so have a, a good evening everybody and welcome to this uh, presentation uh just uh, one minute i'm going to share my screen um okay can you see my screen Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much again. Uh, uh, I would like to share my uh, uh, my thermal processing history a little bit uh, in this presentation and moving from thermal to non-thermal. Okay, it's kind of a uh, uh, a journey through traditional uh, thermal processing techniques, you know, which has laid foundation for you know our understanding of food. technology you know from the beginning you know almost a two century you know journey so that's what i'd like to start with and then reach the non thermal link between these two okay so i'm not going to be uh, i have i know i could have presented everything on non thermal but i thought this would be you know more interesting so uh, that's the way i have arranged a journey from the traditional thermal to novel thermal and non thermal you know processing okay as i um, uh, as i was uh, introduced you know yes you have been at mcgill university for the last uh, 30 33 years that's my first job and probably i'll be retiring you know here as you know my last job as well okay so it's a long history again you know in terms of service at uh, mcgill you know we like it you know mcgill university is one of the top universities you know in canada so i'm proud to be associated with that and in fact when i joined in 1987 that's when the food science department was also established so we were kind of there from the beginning so you know i'm proud, very proud to be associated with this uh, when dr mohan naik asked me about this okay i said i was very glad to accept that because we had two big projects actually three big projects with uh, uas in the past uh, headed by one of my colleagues dr raghavan you know through uas uh, you know uh, in bangalore then uas darwad and also tamil nadu agricultural university so establishing you know post harvest technology you know uh, uh, fundamentals in these uh, universities so uh, so i think it's nice you know to share some of these things you know with you uh, i know you, you are you know with the uh, different backgrounds you know i i hope that uh, you know there will be sufficient interest to 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 listen to something you know maybe sometimes little technical uh, you know I, but i try to keep it simple little overview type of uh, you know presentation so you know you can understand the the journey okay so i have a lot of slides i don't know how much i can uh, you know present but uh, i'll try to accommodate uh, you know this in a in a maybe going forward little faster okay this is my the introduction of my uh, presentation uh, an introduction to uh, the thermal processing at least recognizing couple of big names in thermal processing uh, then going to thermal processing especially related to pasteurization and sterilization i'm not going into other thermal processing applications like drying and others uh, and then touching upon the novelties uh, the ones that are more recently introduced in in the area of thermal processing and then moving on to the non thermal technologies again linking thermal to non thermal and providing some uh, concluding uh, remarks okay so in terms of food processing objective the primary objective of food processing is to is to create safety and stability that means to preserve the food okay from safety concern obviously we need to eliminate or uh, disable all the pathogenic bacteria from food 
Okay, and from stability point of view, not only we have to do that, not only we have to make it safe, but also we have to eliminate or disable the spoilage bacteria. Otherwise, you know, the product may be safe, but it's going to spoil. Again, in quality point of view, you also have to inactivate the uh, the enzymes that can cause of flavors and of uh, colors, discoloration, etc. So, uh, and then again, provide a, a safe condition for the extended uh, uh, storage. You know. Uh, possibilities okay uh, again i would like to recognize the, these uh, couple of uh, names uh, you know uh, uh, great names you know uh, way back in the 18th century 1809 this is when you know france was engaged in war against the neighboring countries food was getting short and the army was not getting proper food and it was uh, they were undernourished so uh, napoleon announced a huge um, you know prize for anybody who can invent a you know, uh, a concept or a, or a technology that can, you know, preserve the food so that he can, you know, uh, feed his uh, uh, military. Okay. So in response to that, one French confectioner, Nicholas Uppert, he actually in introduced the art of canning, not a science of canning, but more a an art of canning. Since he was the first one to introduce the canning also is uh, sometimes referred to as apertization or sterilization. Sterilization is the one that's actually uh, intended, but because of his name, it's also called apertization. That's the picture of Nicholas Uppert. And, but he didn't know the scientific basis. It took almost 50 years until Louis Pasteur discovered all the spiderages and all these spontaneous things are really due to uh, microbial growth or microbial activity. Okay, so the microbiological basis was established, you know, after almost 50 years, okay, when Micro, mic, microbiology was established not only for uh, uh, pathogenic activity, but also for the spoilage activity. Okay, so Pasteur, Louis Pasteur, and Fincy was the first one to link the safety with respect to microorganism. The, the pasteurization also is named after Louis Pasteur. Okay, so between pasteurization and sterilization, they are very similar in terms of concept. Only thing is one is a little milder, the other one is more severe in terms of uh, 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 heat severity. Okay, pasteurization with a milder heat treatment provides better quality, but a short shelf life. On the other hand, sterilization with its intense heating provides a longer shelf life by actually sacrificing part of the quality. Okay, so it's a compromise between uh, shelf life and then quality. Both of safe, in order to, the, the driving force for both of them is safety, but in one case, it's, it's a short shelf life, the other case, it is a long shelf life. Again, in terms of the thermal processing purpose, you know, from safety point of view, obviously we need to reduce the pathogenic bacteria. The one bacteria that's very important in thermal processing uh, applications, especially for low acid products, is Clostridium botulinum, which is an anaerobic spore forming bacteria that actually produces botulism toxin, which can kill people even in nanogram levels. Okay, so therefore eliminating a Clostridium botulinum is the primary concern for thermal processing of all low acid food like vegetables, meat, fish, and other uh, foods which belong to low acid group. Okay, so therefore, statistically, it's uh, set to re to reduce the incidence or the growth and uh, occurrence of Clostridium botulinum in terms of one to ten in one in ten to the twelve cases. Okay, it's a lot of safety in terms of reducing the probability of survival of Clostridium botulinum. When the process is given like that, it's considered as a botulinum cook or bot cook. That means it eliminates the possibility of any botulism uh, incidence. Okay, so from stability point of view, we have to make it also, you know, this minimum is there, but sometimes we may have to give even more intense process because not only we need to kill clostridium botulinum we have to also kill other spore forming 
uh, uh, spoilage bacteria. They, they, they may not be harmful, but they will spoil, you know, especially when the product is at room temperature. Okay, these are called mesophilic spore farming bacteria. They grow at room temperature, so you need to eliminate them as well. Otherwise, the product is going to spoil. So therefore, from stability point of view, you may need to cook even longer than what is required for Clostridium botulinum. After that, we basically create conditions inside the can to suppress other activities, okay? So actually thermal processing, although we call it sterilization, it's really not complete sterilization. So we only eliminate what we don't need it and which where there is no concern, we don't mind if it stays there, okay? In many of these uh, canned products, there are microorganisms you know, especially the thermophilic bacteria, we don't intend to kill them because it requires a lot of heat in order to kill them. But since thermophilic bacteria only grows at temperatures above, you know, 40, 45 degrees, so most of the case, these food products are stored at room temperature, you don't need to kill them. Even if they are present, they cannot grow. Okay, so that's the principle on which the thermal processing is based. I summarize them in here. First of all, as I said, the foods are classified into two groups, high acid groups and the low acid groups. And the dividing point between these two is the pH level of 4.6. Okay, why is this 4.6? It is this particular pH, which is the minimum that's required for the growth of Clostridium botulinum. Below this uh, pH, not only Clostridium botulinum, none of these spore farming bacteria are able to survive are able to reproduce, okay? Therefore, the dividing line is the ability of spore farming bacteria to grow, okay? So, but since they don't grow at pH below 4.6, we don't need to kill them. Okay, so all that we need to do is kill vegetative pathogens, which can be done at temperatures below 100 degrees. That's where pasteurization is aimed at killing only vegetative bacteria like E. coli, Listeria, Salmonella, etc. Okay, and they're all killed under pasteurization condition. Bacterial spores are inactive, and therefore, these pasteurization conditions themselves can create extended shelf life. For example, fruit based products where pH is less, just pasteurization can make it shelf stable, okay? But for low acid product, that is not the case. We can still do pasteurization to kill vegetative pathogens, but the supports are going to be still active. In order to prevent their growth, the product has to be refrigerated, okay? So milk, for example, it is pasteurized and stored in a refrigerator for extending the shelf life by maybe a few weeks. It's not extended for a long time because the, the activity still goes on. They multiply and they spoil the product. Okay, so pasteurization can be applied to low acid, but it provides a small shelf life extension. If you really want to go further, you need to give commercial sterilization. As I said, we call it commercial sterilization to make sure that there's no viable activity under the room temperature storage conditions. Here, we kill all the pathogens. We also kill all mesophilic spore forming you know, bacteria. And definitely, we kill Clostridium botulinum, which is the pathogen. And here, we can expect the shelf life up to six years. You know, many times people come to me, you know, they want to send some, you know, they put products to space and they need a 15-year shelf life. You know, it's very difficult to test really if they can stay 15 years, but we have to kind of make a projection based on a couple of years of storage, you know, how, you know, under which temperature it can really go that far, okay? But in this case, as I men mentioned, thermophilic bacteria can stay there, but it's not going to multiply, okay? So that's how we get this conventional thermal processing, okay? So the conventional thermal processing, again, is focused on... Uh, 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 and focused on uh, uh, safety and stability. The process times are usually long and uh, safety and stability is assured, but the quality part is generally ignored, okay? So it's generally considered thermal process, process or canned foods are considered to be kind of a second rated quality product, okay? Not a very high quality. So it's a moderate or sometimes even low uh, quality as far as the, you know, when a product is concerned. So, you know, there are many now uh, te technologies, um, uh, you know, which are available to conventionally process these products. Okay, these are all different retard systems that are commercially available, you know, conventional batch type of products, horizontal here, and then uh, it can be vertical, it can be horizontal, it can be water-based, it can be steam-based, it can be uh, continuous, it can be static. So there are 
hundreds of different types of retard. They all usually process the product under conventional way to make sure the product is safe. Okay. But today, I mean, these are the, some examples of thermally processed horticultural products. Uh, you can see, you know, some names I have picked up from, from uh, Indian supermarket things. Okay. So, uh, you know, uh, they are dealt with the same way, whether it's Indian food or, you know, uh, North American food, they're all canned the same way, the same principle of eliminating, you know, Clostridium botulinum, and then, of course, uh, uh, to making shelf stable, you have to create the other spoilage, you know, bacteria. Of course, fruit products, you don't have to go there, but you can see here, both uh, vegetable products and also fruits product, they can be in cans, they can be in glass jars, they can be in pouches, but the principle is same in terms of establishing the process. Uh, these are some more products from India. Uh, it's mostly dairy-based you know, product. Again, the principle is same, but because these are also mostly low, low acid products and they go through the same kind of uh, application. But today the consumer wants more than just safety, more than just stability, okay? They both are interested in improved quality, okay? They want to see that these canned products will have a better quality than what has been produced in the last, you know, 100 years, okay? So they want more, they want better, okay? So uh, there are special techniques being actually established in order to do that, okay? So uh, these special techniques are usually relayed on improving the rate of heat transfer into the cans during the cooking process, okay? There are, we all know there are two different uh, major types of heat transfer. One is conduction heat transfer, which happens in solid foods, and convection heat transfer, which happens in liquid or liquid particulate foods, okay? So the left one here is the conduction heat transfer equation, and the right side one is the convection, okay? So these are the parameters that are important in conduction, like uh, conductivity, area, temperature difference, and the thickness, uh, you know, or the diameter of the uh, can, okay? On the other hand, convection is the heat transfer coefficient, area, and then delta T. So we try to maximize each of them and minimize the thickness in order to promote better heat transfer, okay? Well, once you have a better heat transfer, it reduces the cooking time, or for, therefore, it gives you better quality product. We are familiar with the HTST concept, high temperature, short time concept, okay? So the high temperature, short time by itself will not really provide better quality if the microbial destruction and quality destruction are similar. They actually, you can get better quality retention in HTST only because the thermal destruction of nutrients, you know, they, they are much more stable as compared to the microorganism, okay? So otherwise, simply high temperature, low, you know, low, uh, sorry, high temperature, short time, uh, low temperature, long time, they kill the bacteria the same way, okay? So in this figure, I've shown here different relative time, T1, T2, T3, T4, T4 being short, T1 being very long. On the temperature scale, again, you have T1, T2, T3, T4, T1 being low temperature, T4 being high temperature. And you see here, this is the, th the destruction data for botulinum. So everything has to be, you know, on this, point on this line or on the right side of the line to be safe, okay? So all the points that I have circled here, long time, low temperature, short time, high temperature, they all do the same job, okay, in terms of creating safety. But nutrients are more stable. This is the lines for nutrient destruction. While we are talking about 12 log cycle reduction for cartridium botulinum, even 90% destruction of nutrient requires much longer time, much, uh, uh, I think recording stop, I don't know if somebody wants to activate it again. Um, so it requires much longer uh, 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 restriction time than to create 12 log cycle reduction. 12 log cycle is 99.999999 times like a 10, 10 uh, nines there, okay? So that high level of uh, destruction, but we only destroy 90% of the nutrient. These parallel lines, they show reduced time for reduction in destruction of the nutrient. Okay, this is the 50% destruction line, 10%, 5%, and 3% destruction. So on this line, you only destroy 3% of the nutrient. Okay, if you look at these four points, the top one, you know, long time, low temperature, it results in 50% destruction of the nutrient. 
the next one 10 percent the next one five percent and this highest temperature lowest time results only in three percent destruction of the nutrients okay so that is the principle behind the hdst process okay so because of the differential sensitivity of uh, microorganisms versus uh, quality factors, we can get better retention of the nutrients as we go higher temperature and shorter time interval. But in order to do that, you need to have rapid heating conditions. Okay, so that's the important thing. Okay, so how do you create rapid heating? You can agitate containers during cooking. Okay, there are three different types of agitation that are recognized. One is called axial, axial agitation okay it is mostly for continuous cooking processes the cans are held in a, in a in a helical shell and they rotate in an axial fashion as they move from one end to the other end okay so provide you know the the circular rotation okay whereas the the uh, 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 the second one which is called end over end the cans are actually locked in a cage and the cage rotates moving the cans up and down up and down up and down in an end over end type of agitation the both of them give you a high heat transfer coefficient that makes the q become higher okay so this is a conventional uh, uh, act, uh, like end over time where you can lock in the car inside this and this this whole cage rotates during cooking it's a batch operation but it provides end over end type of agitation the axial agitation is in continuous turbo cookers where you have a helical shell that's rotating you know helical reel in, rotating inside a shell where the cans enter from one end and they move along the helical coil go from that end to this end where they are going to get they are getting cooked they, they are going to be processed in this shell which is the processing vessel and then we have a pressure cooling and then we have atmospheric cooling all through they move in a continuous fashion all along in an axial way as they are rotating in axial way they provide the agitation so this also is a very good one for providing agitation during cooking the third one which is more efficient than both of them is what is called a shaka system a shaka system is a shaking system instead of rotating the, the the platform you know the cans loaded here they are shaken they're laterally they you know that's the most of the time that's what we do if you have a bottle with a pulp settled in and the juice what do you do you don't try to rotate you don't try to do like this you shake it so shaking is the best way to mix the contents okay therefore this gives you the excellent mixing of the content the lowest processing time that you can get is using this technology okay uh, so these are all products that can benefit by rotation or agitation process they're all particulate product in suspend suspended in liquids so the particle and liquid gets mixed very efficiently that improves the agitation improves the heat transfer reduces the cook time so it's the perfect candidate for particulate liquids okay again you can see these things some of the dairy products that uh, you know that can benefit from this type of uh, application so some of them you know are uh, available in india as well okay so they are all benefiting from the agitation process the third one which is uh, very important is aseptic processing especially for liquid product here the product is product and the container they are sterilized separately not inside the cooker not inside the retard you know a product is sterilized using a heat exchanger we're exposing the product to a very short temperature so product quality is very high because they, they, they you know you're using the best way to sterilize improve in heat transfer coefficient increase in surface area increase in delta t so all these contribute to very high you know rate of heat transfer therefore excellent quality retention okay the containers are independently sterilized as well using chemicals like hydrogen peroxide is an excellent sterilization agent especially for paperboard and other type of uh, container not necessarily metal okay so now the sterile product is filled into sterile containers inside a sterile atmosphere an aseptic atmosphere okay they are sealed and then they come out of the system so therefore this provides the excellent product uh, uh, consider quality consideration point of view for all liquid product today almost all liquid products are aseptically processed okay to provide excellent quality product 
okay so again you have so many of these you know market you can see so these are all cartons okay so normally you cannot process them in retard okay because they're all paper based paper based okay on the other hand these can be easily sterilized using h2o2 or you know hydrogen peroxide and then they are packaged inside the aseptic environment okay so again all these things are very uh, uh, popular in everywhere okay you know you can see all these uh, dairy product they are all today all aseptically you know processed okay so the the last of them in terms of uh, 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 these are all the previous ones are all convection heating and if you have a conduction heating product a solidly packed product you cannot agitate you cannot improve you know uh, uh, the heat transfer by shaking or by rotating or whatever so you need to use a, a different approach for conduction heating product okay so that's why in the conduction heating equation we make use of this x which is the thickness okay so a can occupies a larger volume surface to volume ratio as compared to the smaller compared to your volume ratio as compared to a pouch the same volume expanded you know and made into a smaller thickness okay so now the heat transfer distance is small therefore the heat transfer rate is high okay so basically we aim at increasing the surface area and decreasing the thickness thickness is in the denominator so smaller thickness makes higher q same way larger a and larger delta t promotes better q okay so that's the principle on which the retard pouch processing is developed okay so this this process this package was developed by us army okay and then in in with uh, Reynolds Metal Company. Okay, this is a pouch that consists of three layers, okay, with very specific function. The outer layer is a nylon, which is printable printability and very, it gives you the strength, okay. The middle layer is aluminum foil that gives it all barrier property. Nothing goes in and out along, you know, uh, through the aluminum layer. And But it, you cannot seal aluminum, okay. So you need a a sealing area which is usually a plastic film okay so these three thing these three layers are glued together with a special glue to make it this retartable pouch okay the army introduced this to give their military very high quality product okay so it's a very specifically designed you know pouch today also it's used okay um, uh, it, the quality is very good but it takes a very long time to fill and seal so therefore it didn't survive the the processing conditions in the north american contact okay so it didn't pick up very you know high as much as they expected it but today most of these things are produced in india or china okay where labor is not as expensive as it is in north american context or european context they are produced in in these countries and they are exported back to europe and others okay so you know it's a combination of the two you know uh, cooperation to produce high quality product also today there are other similar things which are much easier to fill and seal these are the semi rigid plastic containers which you know can be exactly benefiting from the same principle in terms of filling and sealing okay much more uh, uh, much more attractive than retractable pouches okay because these can go on a conveyor you can fill and you can seal you know much easier than handling the, the the pouches in a vertical fashion and then sealing it okay but still these are very slow these vacuum sealing machines for pouches and uh, these semi rigid trays maximum you can go about 20 to 30 pouches per minute on the other hand the cans can be sealed almost like high speed canning you know 200 cans per minute very very high speed okay so you can't get that speed with this so generally these are only for specialty product you know volume wise much lower than normal you know volume that are used for other canned product okay so but all these different approaches are used mainly to bring the quality of thermally processed product closer to the fresh closer to the other you know processes like frozen foods okay so they are all aimed at co making consumer happy with thermally processed product okay you can see examples of this uh, conduction heating products in here okay so you know you, as you can see you know it, it's very difficult to shake this okay so therefore the only way they are processed better is by keeping the the thickness small 
okay so again you can also some dairy products you know uh, that can benefit you know you can see paneer and things like that mtr product yes they can be used you know uh, for getting high quality product okay so those are some of the developments in conventional thermal processing of product there is a new trend there's a new trend today which is probably very good for under indian processing condition for horticultural you know especially for vegetable you know product which is called acidified thermal processing okay so we already saw when the ph is low they are low acid product they require a high amount of heat to kill the spore forming bacteria clostridium botulinum and others so very heat severe therefore it can destroy the quality so rather than doing that way if you can add some acid to the vegetables okay and reduce the ph below 4.6 today in india we almost use acid in all our cooking we always add some lime juice lemon juice we add that so instead of adding that in the end if you can add the same thing during processing the pro the, the ph is going to go down below 4.6 then you can treat them like acid product like fruits and you can just pasteurize them and that makes them stable okay and as long as the quality is not going to be impaired you can get excellent product okay so this is the principle driving this particular uh, uh, type of product okay only if the product quality is not going to be influenced by the added acid and heat yes you can do that okay so and a lot of products are being processed in this fashion you can see that gives you very you know this is for mushroom okay so uh, this is a, a, a raw mushroom this is blanch mushroom this is after processing okay uh, with uh, acidified you can see there is almost no damage you know to to the uh, uh, pieces of uh, mushroom and you can see data here that shows how the hardness or the texture of uh, uh, acidified thermally processed product much much tougher better okay these are the conventional you know processing at 115 120 and 125 you can see here it's also higher temperature is slightly better but compared to this this is double the retention of textural property okay so you know uh, so it has very big advantage in terms of quality retention okay so this is chickpeas we use lot of chickpeas you know chana you know again this is conventional cooking you can see all the pieces are uh, split you know overcooked on the other hand the acidified thermal processing beautiful kernels and they have very high retention of color and texture value you can see here the huge difference between you know chickpeas thermally processed conventionally versus acidified thermal processing so this is one way to go in terms of producing cultural you know like vegetable product where acidity doesn't damage the product quality okay so i think it's a very important step you know that we can make use of in india in order to promote you know this also it can be easily done at home home canning you know because very easy there's no safety big issue in one whereas the low acid product always safety concern clostridium botulinum here because of the acid you don't have to worry about clostridium you know botulinum okay so that's why it's uh, it's very very attractive okay um something came up here uh uh okay so okay we also did same thermal processing for reducing allergens okay because allergen you know allergy is very something very serious everywhere in not just uh, you know north america you know uh, it's restricting a lot of you know a majority of population to avoid you know because there is no cure for allergy okay so only thing is you have to refrain from using it okay so in canada there are you know a, a dozen Uh, allergies are recognized as uh, you know really problem allergies okay and a lot of people are affected by this okay so we did uh, use thermal processing to reduce the allergens especially in mustard and soy soy as taking as uh, examples you know so basically we have uh, uh, yellow mustard and then soy we prepared the product we you know grind and prepared a 5% slurry of these products okay and then we filtered and we actually gave process which is much more severe than conventional thermal processing for conventional thermal processing we use a process lethality of 5 minutes equivalent heating time at 121 for 5 minutes at 121 c degree c okay but here we went further up to 20 minutes okay it's over processing but more 
especially with the intention of reducing the allergen. Okay, so you can see that this is the uh, concentration of the allergen. We started at PPM level, okay, PPM level as like before processing, and they are reduced to PPB level. That means a thousand fold reduction in allerg allergen, you know, uh, causing, you know, compounds. So that's a big step, okay. Most of the cooking processes, they only give about 90 to 95 percent reduction in the allergen level. This process gives you 99.99 percent reduction. So it's a big step moving forward to make uh, these products. You know, uh, if you can go further like this, okay, reduce the allergen level. Maybe you know the allergen sensitive people also may be able to consume these products. Okay, so this is with respect to this is the Elisa you know, uh, result for the allergen. And this is with soy. Okay, same thing. Okay, you have different uh, temperatures here, the reduction in uh, 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 the uh, immuno reactivity, especially they're all again in PPB levels. Okay, so the unprocessed one, okay, so there's no reduction, obviously. So the intense thermal processing, you can say 3.42, 3.74 4, log cycle reduction in the allergen concentration normal cooking is the only 1.5 1.5 is 90 about 95 percent reduction whereas this one is 99.99 percent reduction in the allergen so by proper use of the thermal processing facility you can extend the 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 work to even allergen reduction okay are reducing the allergen sensitivity you know of uh, some of these you know products Okay, so they still belonging to conventional thermal processing area, but today again we have some new approaches in thermal processing, like using novel thermal techniques. Okay, like these include microwave heating, radio frequency heating, and ohmic heating. So these things don't use the conventional water or hot water or steam for heating. They generate heat in a different way. Okay, so let's look at briefly these and see how they can help in terms of uh, uh, achieving better rate of heat transfer. So first one is microwave and uh, microwave and radio frequency. They heat the product in a very similar way. Okay, so these are usually they are called you know uh, uh, ionic uh, polarization and dipole rotation. Okay, so uh, most products have ionic components they're they're split and they're in response to the oscillating electric fields in microwave you know in my in a microwave field or microwave oven they try to align themselves in us in sequence or in synchronization with the oscillating electric fields okay so this is what happens when you have uh, uh, split uh, 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 salts where they can go back and forth back and forth like this Okay, the other one is what is called a dipole rotation. Water is one of the dipole materials. It has both positive and negative charge on the same molecule. They're not split. Okay, so they cannot go back and forth. They only go flip flop, flip flop like that. Okay, and whatever you are seeing here, maybe it's happening maybe one or two times per second, as you can see here. Okay, in microwave oven, these operations like ionic polarization and dipole rotation, they happen 2450 million times in one second. Just imagine how fast they are, they are, they are vibrating in order to respond themselves in line with the oscillating field. 2450 million times. Okay, so such a high kinetic motion, such a high kinetic energy, such a high friction. So that basically generates heat within the body. Okay, so microwaves generate heat internally. There's no heat transfer surface from outside going in and heating the product. So it's the internal bulk heating of the sample resulting in instantaneous heating of the product. So it's a wonderful thing, you know, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, reducing surface barriers and heating the product from within the container. Okay, so that's why it's very attractive. Okay, so... Uh, there are, uh, of course, microwave have some restriction, okay, because microwaves are used in our cell phones, microwaves are used in telecommunication systems. So you cannot use indiscriminately 
you know, their different frequencies, okay? So for industrial, scientific, and medical frequencies in North America, only these two frequencies are permitted. One is 915 megahertz, you know, for industrial application, which has a deeper penetration power, and 2450 megahertz, which is what we see in all our uh, microwave at home in our kitchens they use 2450 industrially they go 915 the lower the frequency the deeper is the penetration okay so that's why we use 915 for industrial applications okay so there are a few other frequencies permitted worldwide with limited you know use in different you know countries but still the most widely used one is 915 and 2450 megahertz okay so it's you know you cannot use just like that anything that you the, all these things need permission and it's restricted because otherwise we are going to interfere with our telecommunication radar communication even our cell phone will, will have problems in terms of uh, use okay so the, there are many applications for uh, microwave uh, heating anything that you need to heat you can use microwave. You can do microwave cooking, microwave pasteurization, microwave sterilization, microwave thawing, microwave blanching. You can in, you know, make reactions inside microwave oven. So everything, whatever we can do with normal heating, you can do with microwave. And it's more efficient and you know, uh, 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 more energy conserving and also more rapid. Okay, so that's why it's very useful in many different types of application. We have done a lot of work in this. Also using microwave as a heat exchanger. Okay, so you can put a coil, glass coil or a Teflon coil inside the microwave oven and send the liquid through it, just like a conventional heat exchanger. Here the advantage is very big. Okay, normal heat exchangers, you know, in a, you know the, the heat transfer surface is at a very high temperature. If you want to pasteurize, you know, for achieving 80 degrees, the surface will be at 150 degrees. So any product that's in contact with the surface, you know, especially milk and others, you know, you have surface fouling. You know, you have starch materials getting gelatinized, protein getting denatured, and they stick to the surface and they create fouling of the surface, they reduce the heat transfer, and they cause off-flavor formation. Okay, very frequent problem in conventional heat exchanger. But with microwave heat exchanger, there's no problem because microwave containers, that, that coil that you use is microwave transparent. The containers are not heated. It's only the contents that are heated. So the surface is usually cooler than the contents. Therefore, the fouling problem is completely eliminate okay so that's the biggest advantage you can see the the that in the color here actually yellow is more hot in this particular case okay and then the 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 center is cooler okay so the surfaces are very very hot okay on the other hand here the uh, yeah yellow is hot here also the counter internal is more hot and the surface is cooler that's why you don't have the problem of uh, folding so it's Excellent. Okay. So it's very easy to do that. All that you need is a, a microwave transparent type glass tubing or glass coil, and through which you have, you can circulate, you know, anything, it's a, a product, milk and juice or whatever. You can do this and you can, you know, you can pasteurize condition, you can establish or sterilization condition, you can establish and you externally cool it and you you know, fill into appropriate, you know, container. We have done this for microbial destruction and also enzyme inactivation. And we have shown that microwave is more efficient than conventional heating. That means you can kill more with, at the same temperature, you can actually kill almost like four times more, you know, microorganism as compared to conventional heating. So it provides some enhanced, thermal effects therefore you can reduce the cooking time or you can reduce the cooking temperature both of them will actually give you better quality products so microwave pasteurization offers actually to reduce the cooking time or to reduce the temperature giving you know a high quality product we have found this to be successful for milk orange apple you can do any beverage no problem okay they all could benefit from using lower temperature for pasteurization therefore better quality this is mostly coming because of the enhanced destruction of microorganisms and enzymes through microwave you know processing okay so it's a very nice thing to do 
Okay, these are some industrial examples of uh, microwave, you know, uh, uh, used for pasteurization. Uh, this is in package pasteurization. You can prepare all the you know, vegetable product, cooked, uh, you know, prepared uh, dishes, and then send them through microwave tunnel for pasteurization, okay? And then, you know, th these are some, you know, because we are getting some steam developed inside to make them pasteurize. And after that, you can cool them by injecting some liquid nitrogen to cool them. And, you know, it gives you a very high quality product, okay? These are used for microwave sterilization, you know, again, producing very high quality product. It's it's already commercialized, so you can see commercial equipment that can be used for pasteurization and sterilization of all you know low acid product, you know horticultural product, or you know it's uh, it could be meat and fish and uh, uh, other other type of uh, chicken, like poultry products as well. Okay, so there are other applications also for microwave other than sterilization. You can use for drying. Microwave drying is very popular. Okay, microwave actually boil adds heat to the water. You know, drying we need to add heat to water to vaporize that. Okay, in the case of drying microwave, the, the solid material is transparent to microwave. It's only the water that attracts microwave. So as the drying proceeds, normally you have dry surface outside. Conventional drying makes it very difficult because the heat has to go through that dry surface and the moisture has to eject through the dry surface. So finished drying is very problematic. It takes a very long time under conventional drying condition. Whereas under microwave, it's not a problem. As the, as the moisture recedes inside, microwave goes there. It, it follows the water and therefore it dries out, dries out the water much efficiently. Therefore, microwave drying is very attractive, okay? It's especially for finished drying, it will reduce, you know, instead of four hours, it will reduce that to half an hour, okay? So it's a wonderful thing to add, you know, to conventional drying, especially in the finished stage. Also, it can be used for uh, osmotic, osmotic dehydration, enhancing osmotic dehydration is very slow. It gives you good quality products for sour fruits, uh, but it takes hours and hours and hours. But if you use microwave, if you carry out osmotic drying inside a microwave oven, you can reduce that to 30 minutes, okay? So again, again, something very nice, okay? Uh, vacuum microwave drying, another big achievement, okay? Here, we are using the combination of microwave heating under vacuum condition. So it's a double engine, okay? Microwave adds the heat and it flashes the water out and then vacuum pulls that, a, that water vapor out of the system. So you know, one side is pushing, the other side is pulling. So it's like a two engine, you know, in a train. Okay, so that makes it go much, much faster. Okay, again, today, this technique is used for uh, 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 pharmaceutical product and high, you know, uh, uh, product that has high um, um, value. Okay, so uh, which can be damaged otherwise, so they can be retained much better through this process. Very popular in China right now for many of the herbs and others, you know, to protect the potential, you know, components. These are all some of the microwave gadgets that you can use for domestic work. Okay, you can use, uh, you know, use the cooking of, uh, you know, rice inside microwave. You can heat the product to make yogurt. You can make, you know, today microwaves are not used just for uh, heating. You know, you, uh, normally it's difficult to use microwave for cooking, but the gadgets, some of the gadgets are getting prepared just so that you can make use of the microwave for these type of uh, applications, okay? You can make popcorn using microwave. Normally, it's not possible because it, microwaves give very wet condition. How can you make popcorn? How can you make French fries? You need special tools. You know, with, with those special tools, yes, you can do that, okay? So all these things are prepared just so that, you know, a housewife can actually do much more with the cooking, you know, with the microwave than just by, you know, warming up, you know, the product. Okay, uh, this is a microwave sterilizer for bottles, you know, for baby bottles, nipples, you know, you generate steam and in steam is used for all these sanitation, you know, purposes. Okay, radio frequency is an extension of the microwave. I already mentioned 915 microwave is better than 2450. You can see here, this for these products, you can see the penetration depth is 4.6 centimeters in 2450 megahertz, the domestic oven, it doubles. 
when you go to industrial oven, okay? You can see it becomes four more times here when you use radio frequency because radio frequency uses very low frequency, 27 megahertz as compared to 2450 megahertz, okay? So that makes even very, very deep in terms of penetration. So you can use large blocks you know, for heating, you know, for thawing, for heating and others, for industrial application, the radio frequency is much, much better, okay, than microwave, okay. For domestic, microwave is okay, but for industrial application, radio frequency is better. These are some examples of, uh, you know, commercial radio frequency. Strayfield is a, you know, big company producing uh, uh, radio frequency equipment, okay. This is for thawing, you know, especially for thawing in, for fish products. Usually these products come, you know, in large blocks right, from high sea fishing and, they, you know, they have to be tempered because when they come, they come at minus 80 degrees, okay? And it's very hard, okay? So it's very difficult to cut. So these products have to be brought to near freezing temperature, like minus five, to make them soft. That way it's easy to cut and prepare, okay? So microwave, you know, can be used because microwave, uh, penetrate ice much better than in water. So for thawing and tempering, it's a very, very good, useful, you know, uh, technique to do that. So it's one of the biggest applications, again, for radio frequency for tempering. The another non novel way of looking at it is ohmic heating. Ohmic heating is electrical resistance heating. Okay, so if you put a food product between two electrodes, this was kind of shown in the original, you know, in a, in a, in a vending machines, if you have, if you use a, a, a Frankfurter emulsion, you know, they are kept in the cold, you know, like in a refrigerator, but you want to eat them warm. So you take it out and there's a small chamber where you can stick them together to two electrodes, turn it on within a minute, they warm up. Okay. So due to the resistance for the flow of the current, the Frankfurter heats up instantaneously and very rapidly okay so therefore it's a very useful thing okay so this is the principle on which the ohmic heating is based you make actually food part of the electrical circuit just like a heater we are all used to heating you know like a, you know winter times we use a heater what does the heater do you know it sends the current through a, a heating coil which has a very high resistance okay the wire itself is very low resistance whereas the heating coil is very high resistance as the current passes through it suddenly glows red hot within you know seconds okay so that means the transfer is so rapid and the temperature rise you know is almost uniform okay so that's the principle on which the ohmic heating works you make food part of the electrical circuit you have two electrodes here top and bottom and the food is trapped between them okay it can be particulate food or it can be just liquid food they heat by electrical resistance that's why these are called you know direct resistance heating joule effect electroconductive electro resistance they're all re all to do with electricity and electric heating okay it's very nice you know you can extend this for aseptic processing like what i mentioned before the conventional heat exchanger you can replace that with ohmic heat exchanger okay these are all the electrodes so the food gets heated up between these two and then it moves up between these two and moves up between these two so by the time it goes from here to there in seconds the temperature goes up from 10 degrees to 135 degrees okay very rapidly okay and then they go through a set of holding tubes to keep them at that temperature for you know prescribed uh, periods of time so that the particles get sterilized okay and then they go through a cooler and then holding tank and finally filling into a septic filling units okay so it works very well okay so ohmic heating you can see that it increases the rate very quickly okay so here i've shown you different voltages for ohmic heating comparing it to the conventional water bath heating okay in this case you know it's a it's a large volume getting heated in a water bath it takes 20 minutes to heat this like this uh, uh, product from 10 degrees to 70 degrees okay and at 50 volts approximately you do the same thing under ohmic heating condition applying a 50 volt between the two electrodes okay if you increase these 50 volts to 70 volts, you can reduce the time by one half. Instead of 20 minutes, you can heat that in 10 minutes. If you increase this to 100 volts, you can reduce that further to five 
Okay, this is one fourth of it. In industrial applications, we use several kilowatts. Okay, so very high voltage that makes the heating time in seconds rather than minutes. Okay, so that's the biggest advantage of uh, of ohmic heating. One is rapid heating. Second thing is uniform heating. Okay, and also there is something that we can understand that ohmic heating is influenced by the electrical power. If you have higher power, you can get faster rating, electric voltage, higher voltage difference, again, rapid heating. Also, you can play with the electrical conductivity of the material, okay? And electrical conductivity can be influenced by salt. If you add more salt, conductivity increases, the heating rate increases. So you can actually design your formulation in such a way that it can be heating uniformly using the, the ohmic heating. In most mixture of uh, solid and liquid part, liquid, uh, you know, phase materials like a so liquid solid mixtures. It's the liquid that gets heated up first, and then the liquid will heat the particle. Okay, this is the biggest problem for aseptic processing of particulate product. People drop that idea because you know it's, it's so much problematic because we don't know when the smaller particles, the bigger particles, as they move along the holding tube, it's very difficult to establish you know, precisely how much they heat up. You cannot measure because the particles are moving. Okay, with ohmic heating, you can, bypass, you can bypass that. Okay, as I said, the ohmic heating is influenced by the electrical current and is influenced by the electrical conductivity. Okay, so, and the conductivity is influenced by the salt. So if you can make the particles, you dip them in a, in a, uh, uh, a salt solution, make the particles have little extra salt as compared to the liquid, the particle will heat faster than the liquid. You know, it's a wonderful thing. You want the particle, the, because the particle is the one normally heating slow, now you are creating a condition where particles heat faster, then you don't have to measure the particle temperature. You measure the liquid temperature, which is cooler than the particle, based that in order to establish a safe process. So you don't have to me me measure the particle, you know, moving uh, temperature of the moving particle. You can install, you know, thermocouples at different sections to measure the liquid temperature. You can assume under each of those conditions, the particles will be at a higher temperature than the liquid. Okay, it's much easier. It's an FDA approved, you know, process to tailor the, you know, the heating rate of particle versus uh, liquid, okay? So it's uh, something that you can gain from ohmic heating. So these are all the advantages of ohmic heating. Again, very rapid. There's no need for any heat transfer surface. Again, same as the microwave. Gentle moving of the particles, uh, no moving parts, quiet operation. Everything is, you know, it's energy conservation is even better than the microwave. In microwave, you generate the microwave and then use that, you know, here, you make everything part of the same circuit. In fact, today, for all space applications, ohmic heating is the one that's recommended, okay? So because of the better energy conservation. Okay, these are some of the products that are coming out of uh, ohmic heating, you know, applications, okay? So again, it's coming. It can meet fish, milk. So they all can benefit with the uh, ohmic heating to provide better quality product. Ohio State University in US, they have done a lot of work. They are the pioneers in terms of uh, research in this area. Like Likewise, you know, radio frequency is Washington State University. So some universities are very, you know, uh, concentrating in certain type of uh, technologies. Dr. Sudhish Shastri, who is from Bangalore, he's the one who heads this, you know, uh, ohmic heating uh, section in Ohio State uh, University. Okay. So that brings us to the final topic today, uh, which is the uh, uh, non-thermal processing. I'm not going to be attending uh, 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 too many of these uh, non-thermal processing technologies. I'm going to focus just on high pressure processing, which I have done a, a lot of work in this particular area. You can also use other non-thermal processing technologies like uh, pulsed electric field, uh, uh, pulsed uh, light, uh, plasma. They all give you you know, uh, a good application for certain 
uh, type of applications. Okay, so high pressure again is something that's very popular uh, that has become very popular because it can do many many different things. It can do what thermal processing can do. It can do much more. Okay, in terms of uh, improving functional quality, etc. So let's, let's just go through high pressure processing in the next uh, fifteen minutes, uh, just to give you. Uh, 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 as an alternative for pasteurization and sterilization. And briefly, I will explain what other things it can actually do. Okay. So, uh, just like uh, uh, we have uh, Nicholas Uppert and Pasteur, high pressure processing is pressure based. Okay. So, pressure guru is Blaise Pascal. Okay, he's a French mathematician, he's a physicist, he's an inventor, he's a writer, he's a philosopher. Okay, so this is the famous uh, uh, Pascal, you know, triangle, you know, how, you know, they add up into, into different, you know, as you go down from one level to the next thing. This is something mathematically, it's something very uh, important. And uh, he developed this uh, Pascaline, which is the mechanical calculator. Okay, these are all in... 1600s okay you know when nothing was known okay you know as what as what we know today the pascal's law basically is uh, uh, a change in pressure at any point is uh, uh, in an enclosed fluid is transmitted instantaneously and uniformly uh, that's the biggest thing that we make use of in high pressure processing application okay it's instantaneous and uniform okay it gives you a wonderful flexibility for manufacturing you know uh, in the manufacturing sex section so the main advantages here uh, are characteristics for high pressure processing uh, first thing our objective is to kill microorganism and then inactivate the enzyme yes it can do it okay especially vegetative bacteria absolutely no problem microbial spore yeah, it's a little difficult, but we can still do it. Okay, with the combination of moderate temperature and high pressure, it can do the same job as the thermal processing. We'll see that in a minute. Okay, and uh, it gives fresh like product. It's just the pressure, not the temperature. Okay, so therefore, after processing, it just looks like normal, just looks like raw. You know, orange juice. If, if you process, it will be just fresh. Like, it's like a fresh orange juice, but it can preserve for six weeks other than you know two days you know which orange juice will lose its flavor okay so even after extended you know uh, 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 holding under refrigerated condition up to six weeks you still get almost fresh like product okay the product is independent of size and shape okay uh, wonderful you know in, in thermal processing if you take a large container you probably have to heat forever that's why we went into all these miniature things, okay, aseptic processing, you know, we try to do all of them in small, small size, so that the heating is very rapid. In here, high pressure processing, no problem. You can put small, big, everything at the same way, same time, and your result is same. Okay, it's a wonderful thing again to have, okay, uh, in terms of process. And finally, it's environmentally very friendly all that you need is you know a, a chamber full of water that you can keep on using it you can reuse it reuse it reuse it so there's nothing wasted environmentally it's really perfect okay so that's why it's very very advantageous okay so how high is this pressure we need to have an idea what pressure we are talking about so this is a kind of a pressure scale you know just to show under where the high pressure processing fits in. On the top of Mount Everest, the pressure is very low, below the atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure is 101 kilopascals, okay, at sea level. Okay, if you go on the top of the mountain, low pressure. Sometimes you may even have to use a, a you know, a, an oxygen mask because oxygen level is low there, okay. Uh, and then at the, uh, at the bottom of the sea, it's about 100 megapascals. 100 megapascals is, you know, 100,000 kilopascals. Okay, it's almost like a, a, a thousand, uh, thousand atmospheres. Okay, 100 megapascals. And then if you go, uh, uh, the normal high pressure processing level is between 100 and 1,000 megapascals. If you go down to the center of the earth, it's a humongous pressure. Okay, it's, uh, you know, 
very, very, very hype. That's why when you drill, you know, for oil and other exploration, when once you reach that core, the oil can squirt out, but you don't need any pump. Everything because so pressure, so high inside, it just squirts out everything. Okay. So that's what you do for extracting oil and things like that. Okay. So yeah, just to give you an idea where it is. So how the high pressure is created? Okay. That's another question. Okay. There are two ways of creating. One is called indirect <coughs> indirect way. The other one is called direct injection system. In the indirect way, you put the product in here and then you shrink the volume. That means you move a piston into the chamber to shrink the volume. Okay. Uh, uh, no, actually, this is a. Uh, 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 oops. Yeah. So in 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 one case, actually, you're 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 shrinking to shrink the volume. In the other case, you actually add more liquid to the same volume. In the here, you're adding more liquid to the same volume. That means, you know, it is accommodating much more liquid, okay? You know, if you increase that by 15%, you generate a lot of pressure. Or you basically use the same volume, then shrink it as the volume decreases, pressure increases. It's like P1V1 equals P2V2, like the, like the usual gas law. So you can use one of these two approaches in order to create pressure inside the chamber. There are many different applications for high pressure processing. You can use for pasteurization. You can use for sterilization, uh, modification of the texture, especially you know denaturation of the protein, gelatinization of starch, etc. Creates many functional changes in terms of making yogurt, surimi type of product, which is uh, you know gel formation, acceleration of cheese, and also many specialty applications because. High pressure affects both boiling point and freezing point. Okay, so anything that has to do with these transitions can be actually affected by the high pressure. And we make use of that, you know, in terms of freezing, thawing, fat crystallization, enhancing reaction kinetics for extraction, for example. They are all possible using high pressure processing. And the biggest problem was machinery up until. 25, 30 years ago, nobody thought that we can actually use, you know, high pressure processing equipment to treat, you know, large volumes of food, okay, because it requires very heavy protection, okay, the, you know, the chamber has to contain that high pressure, it's almost like, a, you know, having a bomb, okay, it's going to explode any time, okay, so really you need to have a container that can withstand those pressures, okay, so it was questionable at that time but today engineering marvel yes everywhere there all over the world now we have acb in france cobelco in japan avure in usa nc hyper Beric in spain stansted in uk you know the eps again in in netherlands and uhd is in netherlands uh barto kefa this is in china and you know again so there are many, many countries now who are manufacturing high pressure equipment. Okay, that's why it's coming. Yes, it can be used for many processes. It's not really used for uh, a lot of bulk. You know, it's usually for specialty product where the volume is less, but the value is high. Okay, for that type of application, HPP is really good. Okay, we have uh, obtained, you know, uh, through, uh, as the chair mentioned, uh, yes, Canada Foundation for Innovation provided, you know, 10, 15 years ago, uh, a $2 million facility for us to establish a very versatile, comprehensive high pressure pilot plant, you know, complete with microbiology, quality and functionality lab. And this is the only place we have equipment that can go to 900 megapascals of pressure and at high temperature as well, 135. So this is our pilot plant. You can see many you know, in most universities, just having one high pressure equipment was a big issue. But today, we have actually several high pressure processing equipment to create this uh, high pressure lab. Okay, this is for pasteurization, and the one on the other side is for sterilization equipment. This is our old equipment that we started, you know, 25 years ago with a small unit, and this is an expanded one last 15 years. Okay, uh, just to give a little bit about the popularity of the high pressure processing uh, through research. Okay, so this is basically based on Scopus. You know how many publications are coming each year. You can see here, eighty six to ninety four. Almost there is nothing. Very few publication coming since ninety six. 
it started growing up and up and in a in an exponential fashion okay this is 2014 almost till 10 year old data today it's is going to the almost like a ceiling there okay so that many more than you know 2000 publications you know coming you know each year making some use of high pressure processing i just want to use this to show you know where the research is being focused you know which countries you know which labs okay so here again it's called scopus word cloud okay word cloud you know you just you know when you're generating this cloud you give different parameters you know where you know high first of all keywords high pressure and then the country then the, the institution and then the person so you can do all of them through the word cloud and it can generate very interesting plots okay so this is the word cloud that shows uh, publications by country okay you know the, the bigger the letter more publications are directly coming from that country you can see china you know uscr spain you also have canada uk germany so all these big big letters show there are more publications coming from that country you also see india here uh, you know there are not many institutions in india that actually focus on high pressure a few universities iits now have it uh, but not very popular i'm not very well published or well equipped okay but still there are publications coming from there and therefore you can see the name there okay and this is uh, uh, institutions world over the top 15 and csic is in spain that became number one okay and uh, belgium such a small country they have done a lot of work in high pressure processing china agriculture they started very late you know uh, before 2010 they didn't have anything okay so everything you know in china is after 2000 in the last 10 12 years okay so today they are a very big player in high pressure you know processing washington state ohio state and you can also see mcgill university Okay, we you know we published about hundred papers, you know, uh, on uh, high pressure processing, you know, by then. Okay, so today, of course, we have done, you know, a lot more than that. Okay, so McGill University probably it was the only university in Canada, you know, researching on high pressure processing. Okay, these are researchers, again, focused in high pressure processing area. Okay, some are very popular, very famous. Started long time ago, like Barbosa Kenova, Dietrich Nor. Uh, 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 Professor Liao, Mark Hendricks. You also can see here Ramaswamy, that's me. Okay, so yes, I can be proud. Yes, I've published, uh, you know, over 100 papers in high pressure processing. So it can be, you know, uh, uh, recognized that there is a contribution. So at McGill, we have published more than 100 papers, just, you know, high pressure processing. We have a dozen PhD students and several master students focusing on high pressure processing. And we have worked on many juices, many uh, 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 products for fruits and vegetables. We have done microbiology, enzyme kinetic, quality changes, established pasteurization process, shelf life extension, challenge study. Challenge studies is very important because any anytime you use a novel method, you have to make sure you know you support that with appropriate safety information. So you challenge the process by actually incorporating pathogenic bacteria into the product, then processing it and making sure that the pathogen is inactivated. So that's the, you know, that type of data is needed before the process is, you know, clear to the, to the you know, uh, through the regulatory process. So pasteurization has been very well studied. Early work in high pressure processing, most of them are like pasteurization, you know, destruction kinetics for microorganisms and then enzymes, etc. So this has been very well studied. Today, guidelines have been established. They have all been approved by USDA, FDA, CFIA, you know, no problem at all. Okay. All that you need to demonstrate is five log cycle reduction in pressure resistant pathogens like Listeria, E. coli, Salmonella, etc. We pick up whichever is more resistant and show that your process actually destroys five log cycle of that particular population and it's approved okay all that it required is one minute at 500 to 500 megapascal you know pressure level and that's adequate for all juices especially acid products it's you know it's shelf stable under that particular condition okay so that is very easy a sterilization is more difficult because here not only vegetative bacteria you also need to kill the spores of both spoilage and public health concern, like Clistid Clistidium botulinum, it's a spore-forming bacteria. Spores are very resistant 
for high pressure at room temperature or refrigerated excuse me refrigerated temperature so they require softening of the spore coat by elevating temperature to moderate level like 80 degrees or something okay that softens the spore coat and then you apply the high pressure and it can kill the spore forming bacteria okay so it requires the combination of moderate temperature now you don't have to go 120 130 instantaneously it will go inside the inside the high pressure chamber it will momentarily go to 125 okay and then only hold there for a couple of minutes and they cool down okay so that's why it gives you very high quality product okay and also high pressure accelerates the destruction of microagulars. I'll show a couple of slides to show that, okay? So uh, using uh, these temperatures, actually, we can actually make high pressure give much better quality, you know, sterile and pasteurized product than conventional thermal processing, okay? So this shows here high pressure destruction of bacillus stereothermophila. This is a thermophilic bacteria. We don't even try to kill them under conventional thermal processing but you can do that using high pressure this is 700 megapascals 90 100 and 110 okay you can see the destruction curves of course higher temperature and in the same pressure higher temperature will give you shorter time okay just to compare here um i think something is this i cannot uh, how do i uh okay uh so anyway it's normally the you know it's uh uh d value or decimal reduction time is five minutes at 121 degrees okay so here you can reduce that to seconds okay so that's the biggest advantage of high pressure same way this is clostridium sporogenes a mesophilic bacteria and it can you know be killed also at 100 degrees in less than one minute and 100 degrees, the conventional D value is 100 minutes. So instead of 100 minutes, you're using one minute. Okay, so it's 100 times amplification of the distraction. That's why it's very attractive. Okay, so another unique feature of high pressure processing is the adiabatic heating. Anything, whenever you compress, the temperature of the product goes up. You know, in the back of the fridge, it's always warm. Why? Because there's a compressor. Whenever you compress, the adiabatic heat increases the temperature of the product, okay? So it's shown that, you know, every 100 megapascals increase in pressure, it, it increases the temperature by at least 3 degrees, okay? If you start at 25 degrees, you get approximately 3 degree temperature rise in normal fruit. If the one that contains more oil, based fat based the temperature increases even further okay you can for example soybean oil you can increase nine degrees for every hundred megapascal go up so if you process these things at 700 megapascal you can give 60 degree increase in temperature just by pressurization okay so rather than trying to cool it down you can actually make use of this for giving sterilization conditions okay so that's the principle on which the uh, the uh, uh, high pressure sterilization work okay so normally you take the product you fill that you have to fill that in a flexible container because you cannot have rigid container because the pressure has to be transmitted to the contents okay so you have a flexible container fill it up you increase the temperature to kind of 80 degrees or something by holding in a water bath then it goes inside there okay pressure chamber you fill up the chamber with hot water and then you increase the pressure okay so this is the pressure treatment and once the pressure is done you release the pressure and you take it up very simple operation okay so the whole thing you know the whole process will be finished in 10 minutes or 15 minutes depending upon the size you know and quantity of the material that you are using so for for high pressure sterilization which is called pat pressure assisted thermal sterilization this is the one that has been approved by fda Okay, so you pack the product, bring the initial temperature to about 90 degrees, okay, and then load the sample to the pressure chamber and increase the pressure to 700 megapascal. Okay, so normally sterilization is done between 700 and 900 megapascal. Okay, so under this condition, the temperature goes up for every 100 degrees, the temperature goes up by 5 degrees minimum. Okay, so 5 degrees times seven is 35 degrees okay so if you start at 90 
you are going to get 125 degrees inside the chamber, all the product going to that temperature. Okay. So all that you have to do now is hold it under that pressure, hold it for a minute, two minutes, three minutes, whatever required to sterilize the product. Okay. When once you sterilize, when once you, you know, and then you release the pressure, the minute you release the pressure, it's expansion. Expansion results in cooling. So from 125, the temperature drops back to 90 degrees. Okay. Immediately after, it, depressurization takes only, you know, uh, 15 seconds or 30 seconds. So there is no other technology that can be used to increase the pressure, to increase the temperature from 90 degrees to 125 degrees in five minutes, which is the pressurization time, and then to cool it down in 15 seconds. It's impossible. There's no other technology that can do this quick heating and that quick cooling. Okay, that's the reason you get excellent quality product. Okay, for high pressure sterilization, you have very rapid heating and rapid cooling, and holding time is very short. Okay, so it's a safe process and very high quality product. I'm showing here some examples here. Yeah, everything has two two. Okay, what is this two? First one is before high pressure treatment. Second one is after high pressure treatment. Okay, you can see here, you know, the color actually get intensified. Okay, you can get brighter green color for beans okay orange juice no difference before and after okay strawberry no difference even orange segment no problem and there's no difference grapes no different tomato no all the lake open everything is preserved okay milk there's no problem at all okay and cheese there's no problem okay so with all these products really high pressure is a wonderful thing to do egg yes there is a little bit of a problem okay the egg yolk retains its color, its deeper yellow color, but the egg white, just like, you know, omelet or whatever you make, it becomes white, okay, because the denatured protein there, it's white in color, okay, so, you know, it, actually, no big deal, okay, egg patties that you make, you can get much brighter white patties, you know, for, you know, you're making into a sandwich or whatever, using high pressure processing, but it's not good for everything okay so when you go to some meat products which are red meat okay where the 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 color is associated with the proteins okay and when once the proteins are denatured the color changes okay so you know for example all these meat products you know whether it's a beef or pork or you know chicken they change color but they taste still raw it does cook it's not cooked but they take the cooked appearance. Okay? When once you cook these products, that's the color you're going to get. Okay, but these are not cooked. Okay, they're still raw, but they take the cooked appearance. So it may be difficult to market them if you show these product. You know, uh, people can see. Then if somebody wants to buy salmon, you know, with red color, they want to see like this, not like that. Okay, but after you cook them, it's almost the same thing. Okay, so if you make them cook in the package and then open it up. Maybe it's an educational thing, okay? But these products do change color, okay? Not normal red pigmented meat product, they change their color. But if they're cured product where it's their color stabilized by salts, there's no change between before and after, okay? So there are always possibilities you make them work the way you like it, okay? So, you know, it's good and it's bad as well in some cases. Fish, you know, again, uh, this is the control red in a tuna. You know, even under low pressure conditions like 220 megapascals, you can you know, still nice, uh, you know, some red uh, tint is still there. And the shelf life went by nine days to 19 days, doubling of the refrigerated storage life. So again, you can use that to get extra, extra benefit through high pressure processing. These are all different applications, you know, you can do for preservation, sterilization, pasteurization, self life extension, you know, transformation of meat protein, value added products like uh, seafoods, you know, especially for uh, making surimi and others, uh, shelling, you know, shucking, you know, there are many of these applications that you can do with the high pressure processing. So it can be used for accelerating also additional uses, okay, uh, accelerating the ripening of cheese, accelerating the aging of wine, okay, the wine and others, you're, they're usually aged for six, 10 years to make the better quality. If you subject these fresh wine and spirits to high pressure, you almost can get 
a quality age quality of three three years or four years okay just by single treatment just before marketing if you treat them with high pressure you actually can get better you know flavor better quality product uh, you can increase the shelf life of almost all types of product functional properties can be you can modify the protein to be more digestible to you know to have different functional attributes like you can change the rheological property textural property you know use them wisely in your formulations uh, you can improve the antioxidant properties you know uh, enhance them you know with activating certain enzyme uh, rice wonderful okay so normally in india we age the rice because we don't want sticky rice okay we want age it so that the is more grainy separated during cooking it's like basmati rice for example in china it's the other way around they want sticky rice okay because they want to eat with chopstick they you know that's the the one that they really like it with high pressure processing you can make them either this or that just by treatment condition you can make the surface either hydrophilic or hydrophobic if it's hydrophilic it makes them more sticky if it's more hydrophobic it makes them grainy okay again this can be used in that uh, you can improve the texture of the frozen fruits you can improve the uh, 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 crystal size during freezing okay we can make you know shorter ice crystals to get better quality frozen product you can use it for extraction of value added component from waste for example shrimp waste you can extract astaxanthin you know it's again much more efficient than conventional solvent extraction so you can do many things okay and also you can do for non food application like a uh, strengthening wood for example compaction you increase the density of the wood that make them more strong and many bones that you for medical application high pressure treat them to make them more dense okay that gives improve their mechanical properties etc so there are many many different non conventional uses i didn't have to i don't have time to go through all of them you know unless i give a whole lecture on high pressure so i'm going to stop here just to show a, a bit of a conclusion here uh, public health safety is the uh, uh, top priority for food processing and then uh, food preservation is a, 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 a an associate requirement food security and stab stability are the desired outputs and by wisely using these technology we can achieve all of them so finally from moving from upper to pascal we have come a long way with uh, a lot of progress achieved in the area of food pasteurization and sterilization thank you very much for your attention i hope uh, you know i have given you some take home you know message and uh, these are all some of the books that i have actually edited and actually the chair mentioned about them yeah i have written books on you know uh, post harvest technologies mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, this is my course you know i use this for my teaching and also the food processing mm -hmm. you know it's basically based on what i teach and it can be used for you know books in other universities as well thank you very much if i have any questions i'll be more than pleased to answer if i have time thank you thank you very much sir uh, thank you very much for tailoring uh, your presentation as per our needs sir. Um, really that was a good experience for us and uh, we have seen that the human being uh, nowadays is nowhere compromising safety stability as well as quality for safety and stability we can depend on the thermal but quality definitely we need to reliable on uh, we need to rely on non thermal processing that you have explained very nicely sir and uh, some of the basic heating principle that which is essentially required for uh, our students so that has been very uh, efficiently it has been explained and different uh, process of sterilization and the new trends in uh, thermal processing that has been explained very well and in that we uh, in the acidifying thermal processing was very interesting uh, that we have seen where it is uh, uh, going to reduce the allergens uh, so that was very interesting topic and uh, uh, some of the hybrid mode of microwave technology and their applications uh, that was very interesting and uh, along with the radio frequency and uh, the homic homic heating it was also very nice and uh, and finally the hpp that the high pressure processing um, that too uh, we are very glad to see that high pro pressure processing lab uh, at your uh, university 
and uh, uh, it was a fascinating to see its application for especially for aging of rice which is uh, very well required and as well as for wine and spirits and uh, aging of wine and spirits so there was a fascinating uh, experience that we had today sir uh, thank you uh, for your time and uh, i request the participants if you have any uh, uh, queries regarding uh, the topic that they can raise it uh, some of the uh, some of the queries that has been already raised sir i would like to discuss with you that uh, is it possible to use microwave for milk pasteurization at industrial level if it is so then how economical it will be when it is compared to htst it's uh, it's very much possible it's already commercial equipment is already available actually it's available even for you know, pre-packaged food, which is more difficult, okay? So, you know, just continuous for milk, liquid product. Maybe you don't need microwave because there are other, even better heat transfer uh, approaches are available, like induction heating, maybe even more, you know, appropriate for liquid product, you know, but if you're using actually solid-based product, microwave is much more efficient, but you can do it, no problem. And then, uh, um, uh, if you have, because milk, you know, it's a high volume product. It's not like a small, you know, so you need something that can extend to that level. Uh, as I said, most of the industries, they are going more towards like, you know, plate and frame and other uh, heat exchanges, which, which can do most of the job that is needed. Okay. So maybe there's no need to go to microwave, but yes, it's doable. Okay, and uh, it will that give you extra advantage? Yes, it can give advantage in terms of energy consumption, but I don't know whether cost-wise, you know, maybe you're adding more cost to it. You know, that something has to be, you know, evaluated because nobody, nobody is exploring these things for liquids. Okay, you know, uh, uh, for for bulk. Okay, but yes, it's doable. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And one more question we have from PC, Dr. P.C. Madhu. Why high-pressure sterilization, the protein is denatured? Yeah. Whether uh, the meat is good for eating because the denatured protein is toxic? No, not necessarily. You know, all the cooked products, uh, proteins are denatured. Okay. So that's what we eat. You know, then, you know, many of these denatured products are more palatable. You know, they improve the, uh, you know, digestibility and, you know, uh, not all the product that we don't necessarily take raw protein. Okay. So, uh, you know, maybe some uh, specific proteins may be not appropriate, but in majority of the cases, you know, when we pasteurize milk, it's denatured also. Okay, so you know, so that's part of the uh, uh, our our normal diet. Okay, so uh, I don't think uh, high pressure or microwave it does anything different from that is normal. You know, other than the actual heating. So we have one more from uh, Dr. Sajjad. Use of microwave receptors and the safety regulation in cloning of a bakery food. I don't know whether it is a question. Sorry, there's a disturbance. I can't hear. Yeah, yeah. The one more question was uh, from Dr. Sajjad. Uh, the use of microwave receptor and the safety regulation in cloning of bakery food. I don't know whether he's asking about the regulations uh, for cloning of bakery food by using the microwave. I think so. Irradiation. Uh, microwave has nothing to do with the radiation. Uh, uh, microwave is very low energy radiation as compared to irradiation, which is very high intensity radiation. Mm -hmm. And microwaves do not cause anything to be, you know, radioactive or anything because, you know, it has nothing to do with the high energy radiation. Okay. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are concerned about microwaves. I understand that. And most of the concerns are coming with because of the limited knowledge on the application of microwaves. Okay. So, and uh, there is a lot of concern microwave heated foods are not safe you know people want to stay away from microwave you know these are all just uh, what i will say you know it, it's a myth okay so if you properly use the microwave you can benefit from it okay and you can actually increase the efficiency and everything okay yes you have to play properly you know you can't use metal containers you can't you know there are some restrictions limitations you have to use the appropriate material you know you can't use some plastic materials inside microwave of course it's not going to be safe and of course it's going to release some you know components from there so you have to use it properly. If you use it properly, yes, it it you can benefit from that. Okay, sir. Sir, uh, uh, 
And, uh, I see a question here, how HPP can improve the functional, functional properties. Uh, uh, yes, you know, microwave can be used to to uh, enhance the functional, you know, uh, application of, you know, functional properties of the, you know, protein, it's, it's rheological characteristic, you know, it's unfolding, folding, all these things, you know, different compared to, you know, with high pressure processing as compared to conventional heating, okay? Conventional heating is more disruptive and, you know, uh, uh, in, in terms of causing permanent changes, okay? With high pressure processing, it's a soft change. And then, you know, it, it's much more uh, uh, adjustable to uh, what you really need it. Okay, so you can tailor it to use that to the a particular, you know, specific application. Okay, so uh, 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 you know, like surimi. Surimi is a, a frankfurter. You know, it's a fish gel. Okay, this the gel that's coming out from micro, like a, a high pressure treatment, very soft. Okay, the quality is much superior as compared to a heat-induced gel. Okay, so if you go into biochemistry and other things, you do see many differences between you know, you know, the product coming from high pressure versus. There's a lot of data if you go into literature that shows beneficial effects of uh, you know uh, 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 denaturation or gelation achieved by high pressure as compared to thermal. There's a similar question that has been followed with the protein regarding the protein charring using the microwave. Protein, no, I mean, high pressure is not, you know, it, it cannot break, okay? It's not high enough to break the bond. The covalent bonds are not affected by high pressure processing. It's only the secondary, tertiary, and other bonds that are influenced. Therefore, you can make textural modification, but you can't break the protein, like covalent bond. That's why most of the nutrients are retained. They're not affected by high pressure processing. It's only the hydrogen bond, you know, the secondary, tertiary bond. Those are the ones that are going to be affected. Therefore, the, the functional properties are affected, but no degradation of the proteins are whatsoever. In Thermal of, can do it. Yeah, but in terms of microwaving, uh, is oh, the microwave, microwave yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, microwave, again, is a low energy radiation. It's not a high energy, you know, radiation. Uh, again, you have to choose, you know, the conditions in appropriate way to stop where you need to stop and so on. And microwaves are used for uh, enhancing reactions. Today, you know, the, the conventional fat extraction, for example, the stock slit method, it takes two hours to do. On the other hand, if you microwave extraction, it only takes 30 minutes. Okay, so there's a, such an acceleration of the reaction kinetics to provide you, you know, uh, uh, excellent advantage, you know, of the extraction process. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, sir. But still, I believe that the cost of processing uh, in HP, H HPP is uh, still uh, high. Yes, end. cost is high. Obviously, it is very high, okay, as compared to others. But for high-value products, it can be easily recovered. Okay, that's why today is getting popular. Okay, for uh, you know, uh, fresh squeezed orange juice, for example. Okay, fresh squeezed orange juice compared to a canned, you know, uh, orange juice is one to four, like uh, cost wise. Okay, so it can generate that kind of a value. Okay, it, it may not be for everybody, it may be a, for sophisticated market, but you do get, you know, where quality is important, people are willing to pay that extra money okay so therefore don't use it for everything use it where the there is the uh, uh, value addition you know beneficial value addition okay sir uh, nice to be with you now uh, you. i would like to hand over my uh, to, uh, to mohan uh, to conclude and have the remarks for this session so over Thank to you, you uh, mohan sir uh, mohan here sir hello Hello. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, thank you so much for uh, accepting uh, our requ uh, request and uh, invitation uh, for the part of this uh, international webinar on recent approaches in food processing technology. Uh, we are happy to host you once again in a DSLD Cheft Devi Husur Haveri on 25th of uh, October on the celebration of World Food Day. Thank and, you. Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, this is the. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm actually. I'm looking forward to meeting 
you people, you know, uh, visiting the campus. I didn't know. I thought it was in Bagalkot, but now I see that it's in, uh, you know, uh, in Haveri, which is much easier for me because it's almost on on my route, you know, to Shimoga. So it's uh, I'm from Shimoga. Hosali is the, you know, Hosali Mathura two uh, Sanskrit villages in, you know, in in Karnataka. You know, probably you might have heard about them. That's where I come from. So it's a perfect opportunity for me, you know, to to actually visit you before going there. Thank you. Welcome you, sir. Uh, dear participants, we are reached at the end of the program. On this significant milestone, we have successfully concluded the international webinar on emerging approaches in food processing technology. And this event was meticulously planned uh, nearly more than one month in advance with the help of all the our uh, organizing committee and the staff of the DSLD chef and, uh, in, and uh, all the officials of the University of Horticulture Science Bagal Court. And uh, we are thrilled to share that we have received an overwhelming response over 1,500 participants worldwide and uh, the testament to the expertise for our distinguished speaker in the field of food processing technology. Our distinguished session today morning was inaugurated by our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. N. K. Hegde, who graced us with his inspirational word. Subsequently, the Register of the University, Dr. T. B. Alloli, shed light on the pressing issue in fruit processing, emphasizing the importance of our chosen topic. He extended heartfelt gratitude to all the speakers for gracious accepting our invitation to address this critical subject. The entire program was made possible through the generous sponsorship of the NAHEP IDP cell led by the Professor R.K. Mesta, the principal investigator of the project. The Mesta elo uh, eloquently elaborated on the project objective and how our universities effectively leverage, which enhance the knowledge and the skill for both our students and faculty. The presidential remarks were delivered by the our beloved dean, DSLD chef, Dr. Uh, Lakshmi Naran Hegde, who is commended the tirelessness efforts of the organizer and conveyed the sincere thanks to our keynote speakers as well as our honorable members. And with these formalities, the program uh, inaugural program is concluded. The session is commencement uh, commenced at. 10.30 a.m. morning with the first session started with Dr. Laudip Khao at Helm. And the, her topic is sustainable food processing technology for the future. The elaborately, why these agents need for sustainable foods, environmental sustainability. And she highlighted on plant-based alternative issues, zero carbon emission processing, then shown the developed artificial protein digestion system to analyze the bioavailability of various nutrients. And it was very interesting and felt novel approach in play to analyze the human stomach system. The whole presentation journey was like a minute and we have received overwhelming uh, response as well as numerous questions from the participants. Then the second section, it started at 2 p.m. by the Professor Shafir Rahman and the topic entitled The Future Foods. He highlighted about the demand for the future exponentially growing world's population and he raised the concern about food waste across the world, he emphasized on conversion of food waste from the, all the sectors, namely dairy, fishery, fruits and vegetable, oils and confectionery, meat and poultry industry, and edible edible oils and edible food products and byproducts utilization in one another. He also emphasized on future foods and also their scope in modern world. And our third session is delivered by the Professor Vasali Ramaswamy sir, and he is highlighted the purpose of thermal sterilization and retard processing in food process in preservation of fruits and vegetables. And he's also pointed, 
these consumers are intended interested in both safety as well as in quality and is also towards the topic such as semi rigid packs retard uh, re retard processing acidified thermal processing novel thermal processing technologies like radio frequency heating microwave heating atomic heating and is also brief elaborately about high pressure processing a non thermal alternative for pasteurization and sterilization is also explained its application in food processing and also he recall the various publication in a food processing also in a high pressure processing that is growing exponentially over the year and is also explained high pressure uh, sterilization and also he finally he pointed public health safety is most priority in a food preservation and processing uh, with these words so in these words i want to extend my sincere thanks to our vice chancellor dr nk hegde sir for his constant support and our registrar dr tb alloli sir for his motivation and his encourage to uh, to conduct this event and dr rk mehta sir for his constant support and uh, for approval for funding nhp idp pro uh, through nhp idp and also extend my sincere thanks to our beloved uh, dean dr lakshmi narayan hegde and also i extend my sincere thanks to all three gems of this program dr professor vasali ramaswamy sir and professor uh, yusuf rehman sir and uh, uh, Prof uh, professor lodip kaur for accepting our invitation within a short duration of time and making this program in a grand success and also i extend my thanks to the all our dsld chift college colleagues and staff members and all our uh, organizing committee for making this uh, event grand success and uh, we have received overwhelming response around 1500 participants over the 15 countries so it is very difficult to accommodate to zoom platform so we made online uh, through live in a youtube across the globe in a various countries this program is telecasted through youtube and uh, and this is happens due to our it team and all the organizing uh, members and also i extend my sincere thanks to all the participants and those who spent the, their valuable time in again uh, nurturing knowledge and gaining again the importance of this food processing in a uh, foodist world and uh, thank you uh, thank all you. the participants for your valuable time and concern about this program and uh, in the upcoming days we will need same your encouragement and motivation for uh, various programs thank you and thank you one and all thank you very much Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay, sir. Thank you.